Hi, and welcome to Experience Points by University XP. On Experience Points, we explore different ways we can learn from games. I'm your host, Dave Ang, from Gamespace Learning by University XP. Find out more at universityxp.com. We have a special guest on today's episode, James York. James is a lecturer at Tokyo Denki University, where he researches the application of games in language teaching contexts. James co-edits the journal Ludic Language Pedagogy, which is a space for teachers and researchers to publish work relating to teaching with games. LLP also encourages open conversations about games and play in language, teaching, and learning on their Slack server. James, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. So James, can you share a little bit more about how you came to Tokyo Denki University? Yeah, it's, um, let's think. So I came over to Japan after graduating from university when I was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about 15 years ago. And I wasn't planning on staying in Japan for a long time. I wasn't planning on becoming a language teacher, um, but I got heavily invested in language as a language learner. Mm -hmm. um, I was studying Japanese pretty much full time. Excuse me. <clears throat> and having studied a language, I learned about um, you know best practices for language learning and the methodology of language teaching mm -hmm. through my own studies. Um, at this point, I decided that I was that I wanted to become a language teacher and I did a, an MA um, in Applied Linguistics and TESOL and upon receiving um, this DMA, I got my job at Tokyo Denki University. I, I was basically applying for university jobs to be a language teacher at university mm -hmm. and I was lucky to get this job at TDU um, back about 10 years ago now. So I've been working at TDU for 10 years. Wow. And when you first came to Japan, were you always teaching at the university level? No, I was actually teaching at the elementary school level originally. And um, yeah, I, I was doing research based with young learners in the classroom. So oh, I was, it was a bit of a transition, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy here now. And I know that um, we connected originally because we both know Dustin Stats from Board Gaming with Education. That's and right. I yeah. originally reached out to Dustin because I heard him on a different board game podcast. So I'm, I'm glad to be three degrees of separation between you and I right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's a small world, right? Very small. <laughs> we all know each other. Yeah. yeah. So um, what I'm really interested in, and I, I heard about this, I don't know how many months ago now, but I know you've been working on it for some time. Um, you started at Ludic Language Pedagogy, um, the journal. Like, can yeah. you hear more about the journal and your work with it? Absolutely. So the journal, well, my background, let me, let me explain. So I, as a university lecturer and hopefully professor in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, I clearly need a research agenda and something to output academic um, papers and work. So I'm, I'm heavily invested in you know, game-based um, language teaching and language learning. So, <coughs> excuse me again, um, rather than, well, obviously knowing about GBL as a broad term in educational um, research in general, my specific focus is on language um, learning and teaching with games. So um, having read a, a lot of academic papers and journals and books uh, on the subject of teaching languages with games, um, I became a little bit frustrated with the state of the field in that there's a big disconnect between what's being researched and what's actually being used in the classrooms. So I actually consider myself, um, I'm going to use the term boots on the ground teacher. Um, I'm not researcher main I'm more teacher main with research as um, a kind of sub part of my uh, job if you like and having read papers and papers and papers about how World of Warcraft has different um, potentials for language learning and teaching and you know all these other extracurricular um, uses of games I really found that there was a kind of gap of research where a teacher had used a game in their context. So rather than a hypothetical piece, it was more of a, a teacher focused um, uh, practical piece. And so I, I, I thought there was quite a, a gap and um, th this kind of paper was missing. So uh, another thing was that um, I'm, I use board games um, predominantly in the, in the, the classroom. Mm -hmm. And again, the research is um, heavily geared towards digital games. Yeah. So as a researcher, to publish my work on using board games in the classroom in a, in a real context, um, I didn't really have an avenue to output this, this, 
this work, this research, because I can't publish in a call journal, which is computer assisted language learning, because I'm not using um, digital games, if you like. Mm. So essentially, I uh, identified a gap and we decided, me and my colleague Jonathan Dahan, that we were going to start a journal that was focused on yeah, not hypothetical studies, but practical studies where a teacher had actually used a game in the classroom with a broad um, definition of games, which includes play and other uh, ludic uh, activities. So that is how the journal started, essentially. I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that a lot of the listeners, and I know people that um, ask me about games-based learning, they're coming from a practitioner standpoint, much like mm. yourself, mm. in that they're not they're not primarily researchers. Like, yes, they, they, they see the value of research and they want to know how this is connected to theory, but really at the end of the day, and I'm really glad you brought it up, is that, you know, okay, well, that's great that you're using World of Warcraft in a co-curricular context, but how can I use it? Exactly you know, right, yeah. In the classroom. So I'm really glad you started that journal because there's been a great need for that practical aspect, and I'm glad that you and your co-editor are going to start addressing that. Yep, hopefully. Um, we have three papers that have been published so far, and we have some more in the works. And yeah, essentially, the, the idea is that the journal is open access, so there's no paywall. It, it's free to download any of the materials there. Mm -hmm. um, open. We're also experimenting with open peer review. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with blind peer review, mm -hmm. but essentially, most academic journals, they uh, implement something called blind peer review, where you send your paper, and then two or three people um, read it, and they don't know who you are, so you have to remove your, your author. You mm -hmm. have to remove your name as author. Uh, you don't know who the reviewers are, and it, it's done double blind, so they mm -hmm. don't know each other. We're mm -hmm. experiment, experimenting with open peer review to try and be more supportive and constructive in the review process so that, yes, you do know who wrote this, and you do know who is reviewing it so that you can actually have a conversation around the document rather than um, it being you know blind and uh, you can get a, bit, a little bit nasty occasionally, I guess. So right we're doing right. things like that. Yeah. yeah. And you, all, yeah. Sorry. Or have you identified who you'd like to be your, the reviewers for your journal? Yeah, we have um, a, a fair selection of reviewers now from this field, the, um, the language, uh, game-based language learning and teaching field. Mm -hmm. And we're always accepting new reviewers. Uh, we have a Slack channel where people can join up. And if they want to be a reviewer, they can just um, get in touch with us and we'll add them to the roster. So yeah, we're, we're very open. We're, we're very much about community building. So. Great. If you're interested in games and language teaching, or not even language, it might not be a foreign language. If you're teaching English um, in, say, America or the UK, or if you're teaching you know, the, the native language or literacy skills, we uh, in encompass it all. So, yeah, definitely get okay. in touch. Well, I will um, include your contact information in the show notes so that anyone that's interested in being a reviewer for your journal will be able to contact you. Appreciate it. So um, we started out with the journal, which is the um, the research side of this, but it's still going to be based in, in a practical application sense. Um, yes. I want to go further down that path. Can you share more about your approach to using games for teaching and learning? Absolutely, yes. So my approach is um, I use games as the core of the curriculum, um, not just as a kind of fun treat, which I think that games are often um, you know, reduced to this level. It's They're, they're considered useful for engagement perhaps or as a bit of fun or as a treat after doing some more, more serious work. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I decided to take games as the actual core and we learned around it. We learn around gameplay. So um, for example, in a, I use a, a, a basically a seven week structure where during those seven weeks we'll only play the game twice. Um, so from my own perspective, I think that board game play is very similar to how we learn a language in that you need some kind of uh, receptive skills first. So you're, you're looking at reading and listening and, and, and you know, building up your, your knowledge of the language first and then you output. So you, you'd have the productive skills following the receptive skills. Mm -hmm. Now with board game play, um, I'm sure you're familiar yourself, but you actually have to read a rule book or watch some online videos of how to play the game before you play. So this really fits in nicely with the idea of automatization and, and, and building up your, your rep repository before you actually play the game. So um, yeah, I, I spend a full week on learning the game and then the following week we'll, we'll play the game. So we're outputting the language mm -hmm. and a, a huge part of my um, teaching is the use of transcription activities. So 
Mm. Um, you, you're probably aware of like the, the idea of cognitive load and mm. If you, if you have too much cognitive load, you're not able to focus on the learning. Well, from a language learning perspective, this means that if the game, well, in this perspective even, if the gameplay, if the game is too complex and you're focusing on the rules too much, you're not going to have enough um, cognitive capacity to output the second language or the foreign language. Mm -hmm. So I actually transcribe gameplay and I say, okay, use as much English as you can. Uh, if you if you don't know the English, use your native language. Use Japanese. It's mm -hmm. fine. It's absolutely fine. Do not punish the use of the mother tongue at this stage, mm -hmm. um, because it's all being recorded, transcribed, and then we analyze um, the gameplay. Like, okay, okay, you use Japanese or you use the mother tongue in this particular instance, or you used English here, but it's slightly incorrect. Can we um, change this? Can we improve this for then a following gameplay session? So it's um, learn the game, play the game analyze mistakes that that's three weeks then the fourth week will be a replay session where hopefully they've they've improved their language a little and um can uh, use these new items or new vocabulary new grammar points in their second gameplay session and I, i'll use this cycle over and over again um with with various different games so yeah that, that's the general um i really like how you focused it in um you're using the game as the medium for learning mm. and you're not using it's you don't want to be in a position where you're an educator that is really relying on the game to do a lot of the heavy lifting, but it seems like you're yes. partnering with it in order to use it as, you know, not a replacement for teaching because we know mm. that good educators still need to be an active presence in the classroom, but really using it as that medium. But I, my follow-up question, James, is when I talked to Dustin about this, he had a list of some tabletop games that he referred to. Are there any go-to games on your list that you use for um, uh, language learning? Uh, well, in my particular context, um, I try to find games that do promote conversation. And of course, a lot of board games have conversation as the, almost as the main game mechanic. If you look at hidden role games, the game is progressed through conversation between players. So mm -hmm. these kind of games, if you're looking to build speaking skills, obviously lend themselves very well to this, this type of class. So yeah, hidden role games and uh, cooperative games as well, like Pandemic or... Mm -hmm. Um, Sheriff of Nottingham or mm -hmm. um, yeah, cooperative games like this. Um, I actually steer away from competitive games. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with competitive games in the classroom is that generally it's not team competition. You're playing you versus other players. So it's actually um, a hindrance, if you like, to, to output the language because you want to keep things secret to yourself. So if it's one versus one versus one, like a competitive game, then there, there's not a lot of communication between players. Um, one way that you could get around this is if you put players in pairs and you get them to discuss their strategy together during the game, but then you need a lot of people to play the game. So at the moment, I don't use so many competitive games. Oh, but, uh, just just to bring you back on onto that point about the game not being a replacement for the teacher, I think that's an absolutely key point, Dave. And I'm glad that you picked up on that because I think a lot of teachers or they maybe think that games are a magic bullet that as long as the students have the game, then the learning will just happen. And in my own context, I find that this this is not true, which is why I. Um, supplement games play with three or four extra classes where I can give them grammar instruction or we can uh, analyze their gameplay. You, know, you really need to slow things down and think about your role as a teacher during, during the classroom as well. So yeah, great point. Thanks for that. Great. Uh, and I also wanted to know, since you, you brought up specifically about competitive games, did you ever use any games that um, require a negotiation element? Because the ones that, I, that immediately come to mind are something like Cosmic Encounter or uh, fire whiz kids where you need to, you know, like you brought up Sheriff of Nottingham before, but any other games that you've used with that negotiation aspect? Negotiation. Um, the game, it's called Dragon's Gold. Are you familiar with this one? Um, is that an Aiello game? It sounds familiar, but I feel like it might've been re re rebranded. But I'm not, I'm sure not familiar with it, if you could describe it. Absolutely. So Dragon's Gold is an interesting competitive game where each player ha is, you could imagine each player is a little gang and mm -hmm. you, th there's four dragons on the board and each player can choose which dragon they attack. And once the, 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 um, the hit points of the dragon, sorry, once the attack damage of the players the combined is more than the dragon, the dragon dies 
and some spoils of, of war, if you like, some, some treasure comes out. Mm -hmm. So once the dragon is died, the players that helped to defeat that dragon, they have to negotiate on who gets what treasure. Oh, I see. Okay. So for example, you could have four blue coins, three red coins, and two yellow coins, and then two players that have, have to share that between them so this is an interesting negotiation game also they only have one minute to make this negotiation so for example player one might come out and say oh i want all the red um coins because i'm collecting those but then the other player could say well if you have the red coins then i want all the rest and, and you know so uh, it's an interesting uh, negotiation game and, and if they don't decide who gets what coins within that one minute then neither of them get anything so it's oh, quite fun interesting yeah. i have to check that out then Mm. Um, I know that you brought up your your philosophy behind using games for teaching and learning, but can you identify any other special challenges about teaching language through gameplay? Absolutely. Um, I think that the level of difficulty of the texts actually is um, a big challenge because if you imagine a textbook um, that you're using for language teaching, the content of that textbook has been leveled, if you like, for the learners. So you'll have like into introduction level, um, intermediate level, advanced level, where the, the vocabulary has been through a filter, if you like, and matched to the level of the student. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're using real, authentic, um, off-the-shelf sh uh, off games, the rule books can be quite daunting. And it's, it's interesting to see students, you give them a rule book, and they'll start to read it from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, if it was me or you, we'd go, okay, that's the story. I don't need that. I just need to look at the rules. So we can yeah. actually skip parts. Um, so yeah, the rule books are a big challenge and because obviously because they're not leveled and then in talking of texts, I also consider native speaker, um, gameplay videos as part of the texts as well. So mm -hmm. if I want students to see how native speakers would, would play the game, um, then we'll go onto YouTube and we'll perhaps watch tabletop or other board game um, related channels. And again, the, the native speakers are extremely fluent. Their language is not leveled to the students. They're not taking their time. They're t taking their time. They're talking over each other. So again, to decipher and, and to help students understand what's going on in the gameplay with a lot of idiom, idiomatic expressions and, and things like this, that, that's a real challenge, which again is why the teacher, teacher's role is very important there. We can go in, watch a video with the students, pause it, ask them to reflect and um, translate things as needed. So yeah, that, that's a challenge. Yeah. And again, the final one would be the cognitive demands of the gameplay, which mm -hmm. again is why I um, rely heavily on transcription and supplementing the gameplay with um, multiple weeks of non-gameplay activities. So yeah, nice. so essentially level of difficulty of the texts and the cognitive demand, demand, cognitive demands of gameplay. They're the challenges, I think. I see. And this is a, a side question I came up now that you mentioned it before, but I think I read or watched somewhere that um, being able to speak a language at an idiomatic level is one of mm. the highest achievements you could, I guess, earn as, as a new language speaker. Is that something that you agree with or have any uh, opinions about? Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure about um, other languages, but English is, is chock-a-block, if you like, <laughs> isn't idiomatic. We yeah. have so many Id idiomatic expressions that um, yeah, it's very difficult for, for students and yeah, I agree. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, I know we talked a little bit before about, um, not using games as a replacement for teaching, but using it as the medium to teach. Mm. But other than that, what do you think is another common perception that people have about your work that is wrong? Uh, I don't know about my work. I don't think that I'm actually um, being looked at, but in terms of language teaching in general, um, I think that yeah, the idea of games is as a frivolous waste of time um, that nothing can be really learned from them. I think that that misconception comes from the the idea that games are, are just a treat or just something to do to fill the time. Mm -hmm. And they're not being supplemented with extra activities. Um, so that's one thing, maybe that, that games are frivolous. That, that's a common misconception. Another one is that, yeah, games are only useful for promoting engagement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a lot more that you can do with games, um, especially nowadays with um, smartphone games. And I mean, you can play games anywhere. Um, so you can do a lot more than just in, in, um, promote motivation in the student. For example, you could go online and join 
uh, a guild or you could go on the forums and mm. get involved. You can go on Reddit and learn about a game. You know, there's, there's, there's kind of uh, uh, spaces around gameplay that are not directly within a game that you can tap into as uh, authentic um, L2 texts, if you like. So, yeah, right. let's and do more. I think that um, a lot of that gets held up, I feel, with educators when, you know, we tell them about us using games for teaching and learning. And then the immediate go-to is something like, um, you know, like Jeopardy or Family Feud uh, or like a trivia game. Right. And at the time, I'm just like, you know, there's more to learning than just declarative factual knowledge. You know, mm. like other ways you can use games and it just doesn't have to be about engagement or about learning facts or anything else. So I'm glad that yeah. you said that because it doesn't have to be. There's many other ways you can use games. Absolutely. I've also, the other misconception is that you're doing it to be popular. I've, I've been, to, I've been my, told in the past that, oh, you know, Mr. York, you're only using games because you want to be popular with the students. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, <laughs> at the start of my semester, I hit the students over the head with, we're not just going to be playing games this semester. We're going to be doing some serious analytical work. You're going to yeah. be scratching your head while you're watching YouTube videos. You're mm -hmm. going to be making presentations about your game and whether you'd recommend it to other people or not. Mm -hmm. So I really hit them over the head at the start of the semester just to, just to quash that idea that <laughs> I'm only playing games to be popular or to have fun. It's, no, there's loads more that you can do with games. So, yeah. uh, are you known at your university as the professor that uses games and is teaching and learning? I am because it's very hard not to see me walking down the corridor with um, a big box full of, you know, six or seven different board games because actually my course, the way that it's structured is that the first semester, the spring semester, we only play games that I've chosen. And that's, there's a very specific reason for that mm -hmm. in so that I can make sure that everybody's playing the same game. I can give the same instruction um, after gameplay and just to get people used to the cycle, like the, the play, sorry, the learn, play, analyze, replay, and report cycle. Mm -hmm. So in the first semester, I'm just taking a few games down to class. But in the second semester, I just give the students a bare bones um, worksheet with, with all that we've done in the previous semester. But this time, it's a game of their choosing. So what happens in the second semester is that you might have five or six or seven different groups that are playing different games. So I have to lug these games around the corridor which of course people see and it's like, oh, there's Mr. York with these games again. And I'm like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so yeah. I hope you have a board game bag or something else to carry all of them in. Oh, I have a huge box, like a, <laughs> like a milk cart, if you like, that I take oh, them down. I see. Yeah. Um, so other than your, your milk cart full of games, are, are there any other specific resources that help you to get to where you are right now? And that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so in terms of pedagogy and learning about how to teach, then obviously reading um, about about this this particular field. Um, I don't want to blow my own, but <laughs> if you if you look at something like um, our ludic language pedagogy now, you can see how teachers are actually using games in their classroom, like how what what kind of teaching uh, approach they're using. So knowing about SLA, uh, which is second language acquisition, mm -hmm. knowing about um, different approaches to teaching, knowing about how people are using games, that's a, a great resource. A uh, second one would be, from, for me particularly, would be Board Game Geek, which mm -hmm. is a website where you can learn about um, the you know, up, up and coming board games, the different types of board games. You can join forums to talk about board games. There's even a, a lang not a language, sorry, there's a, a teaching forum. So you can meet other practitioners on that particular forum and, and discuss how you're using board games in your classroom. So that's a great resource. And th then just playing lots of different games by being a gamer, by improving my gaming literacy, I guess, um, is, is a great way to think or consider how, how you might perhaps use a game in the classroom. For example, you might know uh, Hey Listen Games, uh, mm -hmm. or Zach. Yep. He, he is constantly putting out, um, this is a game that you might be able to use in the classroom because of these things. So even if you don't play the game, Zach will play the game for you and tell you how you could use it. So th those resources are very useful, I think. I'm really glad you brought up game literacy because I, I feel that's one of those things that we take for granted, especially if mm. you're used to playing a lot of, you know, I'd say like maybe heavier Euro type tabletop games, or maybe you play a lot of social deduction games. Yeah. Whereas like, you know, the games you play are kind of like your diet, right? Where if you, if those are the games you play most often, those are the games that you feel um, most familiar with and most comfortable with, but they may not be the best for your students for their learning outcomes. And 
I think that's something that I've <clears throat> recommended a lot of educators and other designers, which is just play a lot of different varied games, you know, play tabletop games, play social deduction games, play like mega games or serious games, play Absolutely. with simulations or play with anything else. So I'm glad you brought that up. There's something called the T-Pack. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this concept, no. T-P-A-C-K, which mm -hmm. it stands for um, te technological and pedagogical content knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially a scale to see how familiar you are with the content that you're teaching, how familiar you are, familiar, familiar you are with pedagogical approaches, how familiar you are with technolo technology and, and the, the, the devices that you can use in your classroom. Mm -hmm. So basically, it, it becomes like a radar chart where the more you know about that particular aspect, the, the better you are at, at, as being a teacher, if you like. Well, this can be also extended to games as well. So you can have the idea of not just pedagogy and content and technology. Well, I guess games would be a, a technology, but mm -hmm. how how game literate you are. That's also very um, important if you want to be using games in the classroom. You could argue that if the students have expertise and they bring the games into the classroom that they want to use, then uh, it's very student-centered and you can perhaps learn from them. But I also think that as an educator, you should have that content knowledge, that, that game knowledge when you're coming into a class. In case, for example, a student is stuck on a particular rule, you, you might take 10 minutes to read that if you don't know the game yourself. But if you do know the game, you could perhaps show it in five seconds by moving a few cards around or something. So the idea of having game literacy is um, very important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I know that you've, you've shared your journey and your story to where you've come, where you are right now, but is there anyone else that you think has been very influential in where you are right now, what you're studying, your um, desire to teach others, and um, you're using games for teaching and learning? Yeah, my, my colleague Jonathan Dahan is definitely one of my um, biggest mentors. Um, he has been using games for language teaching since the early 2000s, and when I was originally looking for other work, his name came up again and again, and now I'm working with him on the journal. So he's been very influential to me uh, in, in terms of uh, research and teaching and as a good friend as well. So yeah, Jonathan Dehan. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that there's a book called The Grasshopper, which is about gameplay. And it's written by someone called um, Bernard Suits, maybe mm -hmm. Bernard Suits. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, this book, it, it talks about what is a game and it, it it's just a really comical, interesting, dialogical book um, between a grasshopper and some ants. So the ants are saying, you know, why are you, why, why are you um, playing games all the time? You know, you're going to die in the winter. Mm -hmm. And the grasshopper comes back with a retort about why he, playing, why he plays games and what games are. And it really maybe opened my eyes up to, <laughs> it might, might sound a bit <laughs> the cliche, but the idea of life and, and, and living and being existing as a sort of game as well, if you like. So that, that really was interesting for me. I, li I like that book a lot. I recommend it. It's just called The Grasshopper. The Grasshopper by Bernard Suits. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then fi finally, I would say that Alfie Cohn, mm -hmm. um, he wrote a book called Punished by Rewards. Now, um, maybe some of your listeners are, are big into gamification, but mm -hmm. for me personally, I, I tried to steer away from that. I, I had a a brief experience with it back in about 2011. Mm -hmm. But um, since reading Alfie Cohn and the idea of rewards being kind of punishment in disguise, and maybe you can foster more intrinsic motivation without these rewards, um, that, that was a big influence on, on my teaching. So I don't gamify my class. I don't um, use anything like XP or try and sugarcoat things like that. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's um, a term like nowadays called quest-based learning. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, this is just a jargon term for giving students choice. So, you know, student-centered learning and giving them choice that I try to keep away from some of these, um, you know, jargony terms, but yeah, th that's a good book. If your listeners haven't, haven't read that it's called, yeah, punished by rewards by Alfie Cohn. Definitely yeah. worth a read. Thank you. Um, so what do you think has been the biggest lesson that you've learned at your time at Tokyo Denki University since you've been there? Um, to embra embrace the freedom. My university has given me lots of freedom in how I teach. And some teachers will rest on their loins, if you like, and just <laughs> teach from the textbook and be well, a bit boring, I'd say. But mm -hmm. yeah, if you have the opportunity to innovate, really 
take the, grab the bull by the horns. There's a, an ICDM for you. Grab the bull by the horns and, and go for it. So yeah, embrace the freedom. Be proactive as well. So if you wait for your university to tell you what to do, then you will become depressed quite quickly. So yeah, be, be proactive. Yeah. And if you can't find like-minded individuals in your own context, then go online, start sharing your work because there's people like Dave here, myself, um, the whole of the game-based language, uh, not language, but game-based teaching, game-based learning um, community. Please get in touch and just reach out, make those connections. I don't do any research or anything with my uh, other colleagues at university, but I have many projects that I do online with people from all around the world. So really just go out there and share your work. That's, that's something that I've learned from being based at this university. Great. And in an effort to grab the bulls by the horn, is there anything else that you're curious about that you'd like to learn more of? Yes, actually. Um, I'd like to learn, this is, I guess it's still on topic, but I'd like to learn more about game programming. I don't, I play a lot of games, but I don't know how to code games. So uh, I'd like to learn more about that personally. It, just um, like programming and development, actual digital games? Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely interested in this uh, piece of software called Pico8, P-I-C-O-8. Mm -hmm. It's a super uh, restricted, limited interface and game system. But... My background as, I don't know if you know this, but I think this comes on to your next question, but mm -hmm. I, I make something called Chiptune, which mm -hmm. is 8-bit music using old Game Boys and you know, uh, Nintendo Entertainment Systems. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm very interested in limitations on creativity. So for example, the Game Boy, you only have four channels and certain sounds that you can, can create. Now, this Pico 8 software really um, appeals to me because of these heavy limitations you have and you know being creative within those limitations so yeah game programming particularly in this in this software if anyone has heard of it or maybe not yeah it's called pico 8 check it out so with chip tunes that means you're composing music but can only use a certain number of sounds is that how it's set up essentially what you're doing is you're using the hardware which is in that console if you like mm -hmm. so if you're using a game boy it has a sound chip which is able to output four sounds at the same time a noise sound uh, a wavetable looped sound and then two kind of pulse sounds um, so within there within that limitation uh, i love to see people be creative and, and and just you know really push what the game boy can output um, so that that's why i'm interested in in pico 8 because again it's a very very small limited game development environment so i think i could be quite creative in that Great. Yeah, I know that one of the aspects that really uh, motivates designers is working with limitations. And I think working with a limited, essentially, set of components is, is it, it's working within that same set that you can't, you can't, you know, you can't really deviate from this. This is what you, this is what you have to work with. And this is what you yeah. need to produce out of. Totally agree. Totally agree. So, uh, James, is there anyone that you uh, recommend that I interview next? Um, in terms of game-based learning, I, I think I mentioned uh, Zach just now. Have you m interviewed him yet? Uh, no, I have not. But I, I know that um, we had both connected with Zach, I think, individually on, um, I believe you might have been interviewed by Rob Alvarez on Professor Game. But I know that I, I'm familiar with the website, Hey Listen Games. Yeah, I think he'd be someone interesting to get in touch with. Because, again, a practitioner doing things in the classroom and also sharing his work online. So that would be great. I think one of the titans at the moment in this field is uh, Paul Darvasi. Have you heard mm -hmm. of Paul? Yeah, Paul Darvasi. He's doing some incredible things with, for example, alternative, alternative, alternate, yeah, alternate reality games in the classroom, mm -hmm. and just huge projects that span semesters um, using very innovative um, games. So yeah, he, he'd be something, somebody that I would recommend as well. Great. I'll have to look them both up. And then, uh, James, last question. Uh, if listeners are interested and they want to connect with you online, where is the best place for them to get in touch with you? Uh, they can get in touch with me on Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. My username is CheapShot. Um, just, yeah, just CheapShot. <laughs> and the, the Ludic Language Pedagogy Slack is open now. Um, if you just go to llpjournal.org, you, mm -hmm. you can find information about that there. And finally, Discord, I use that quite a lot. Uh, I can send you my uh, Discord username to you, Dave, for them to be shared. So Great. And I'll yeah. include all of that on the, um, in the show notes with your biography. Thanks so much.
So today on the show, we are joined by James York. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to learn more, then a great place to start is my free course on gamification. You can sign up for it at universityxp.com slash gamification. You can also get a full transcript of this episode, including links to references in the description or show notes. Thanks for joining me. Again, I'm your host, Dave Ang from Game Space Learning by University, University XP. On Experience Points, we explore different ways we learn from games. If you like this post, please consider commenting, sharing, and subscribing. Subscribing is absolutely free and ensures that you'll get the next episode of Experience Points delivered directly to you. I'd also love it if you took some time to rate the show. I live to lift others with learning, so if you found this episode useful, consider sharing it with someone who could benefit. Also, make sure to visit University XP online at universityxp.com. University XP is also on Twitter at university underscore XP and on Facebook as University XP. Also, please feel free to email me anytime. My uh, email address is dave at universityxp.com. Game on.